Professor Wahid Stein. Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, on behalf of the Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, our graduate assistants, uh, Fiza Shahzad, for doing the legwork to make this event possible. And I also want to thank the History Department for extending their logistical support uh, for our uh, programming. Today's event is designed to focus on the ground realities in Indian occupied Kashmir <clears throat> since August 2019 when New Delhi unilaterally um, uh, acted uh, to overturn uh, decades of, of, of established reality. Uh, with the so-called end uh, of a forever war uh, and a seemingly forever pandemic uh, occupying uh, international media attentions, uh, there's been a veil of silence on the plight of Kashmiris who've been reduced to living in an open prison um, with no end in sight, really. I mean, they cut off um, most of them, if not all of them, uh, from uh, the rest of the world, um, we could not have asked for a better person <clears throat> than Professor Sadiq Wahid to edu educate us on what New Delhi's uh, draconian laws entail and have entailed for Kashmiris uh, and the forms of resistance they are putting uh, uh, up in order to exist. Uh, Professor Wahid received his doctorate in Inner uh, Asian Studies from Harvard University. Uh, he's taught there as well, and but he's also held several uh, prestigious academic positions. Uh, he was professor of modern history at the University of Jammu and former is the former vice chancellor <clears throat> of the Islamic University of Science and Technology in Kashmir. He's the author of Ladakh uh, between Earth and Sky and Tibet's relations with Himalaya, with the Himalaya, Himalaya, and has written innumerable articles on Central Asia, Tibetan civilization, and of course the Kashmir conflict. Professor Wahid's intellectual interests are closely intermeshed with his role as a political activist. I hope he doesn't mind my saying that, which in the context of Kashmir, of course, can make for a dangerous combination. Our last meeting, it's impossible for me not to think of it, was at the home of the late Shujaat Bukhari in Srinagar during the summer of 2018. Each time I think of our memorable and most revealing uh, exchange, um, I think of the violence that lies so close to everyday life in the Vale of Kashmir. Shujaat sadly was shot dead weeks later by unknown assailants. Uh, what is life like in such a scenario where if you're not shot dead on the street, uh, you can expect a midnight knock and be whisked away by security personnel and never to be heard of again by members of your family or your community. Resist to exist is a compelling slogan, but what is it really like living at every moment of your life, Professor Rahid? Uh, Please join me in extending a warm welcome to him. Thank you very much, um, Professor Jalal. And I'd like to thank the center uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, and um, also, uh, you know, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on Kashmir, as you mentioned, a topic not all that um, popular these days, or not, let's say, in the news cycle as much. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad to be here. I thought that uh, before uh, talking about the last two years uh, in the life of the former, one has to say now, uh, Kashmir state, uh, or the state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, that is between 2019 and 2021, I'd like to contextualize my talk by putting on the table three assumptions, some may see even biases, as a sort of preamble to where I'm coming from, as it were. First, I think it's important to disabuse ourselves of the false notion that the troubles, the very cruel troubles of the J uh, Jammu and Kashmir state begin with the election of the BJP government in 2014. Um, I, when I say the JNK state, I mean uh, the portion of Jammu and Kashmir that is now uh, on this side of what I call line of control east um, of the line of control. Um, and to say that it uh, begins only with the BJP government in 2014 would be, I think, um, an ahistorical observation for any portion uh, of the JNK state on all sides of the lines of control and actual control for the Chinese side. Uh, for example, in the JNK state, or what I sometimes call LOC East, we are layered with several draconian laws, um, 
not uh, you know for just the last seven years, but incrementally over the last seven decades. Uh, these laws were promulgated by the central, which is the federal government of India, and various provincial king's party governments. For seven decades, the provincial and central governments have put in place ordinances, rules, and regulations, and laws that curb freedoms and liberties to dilute the idea of democracy to the point of being inapplicable for the state of JNK. And this is not just uh, Siddi Wahid sort of observing this. This has been said by central, uh, several international watches, uh, watch bodies, such as Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, um, and uh, many others. Um, the BJP, what it has done is merely added another layer to the already firm edifice built by its predecessors. Uh, predecessors. The difference is that the BGP has acted unambiguously, transparently, and resolutely in the service of its declared aim of transforming India from a secular republic into a Hindu majority or Hindutva state. Second, it must be acknowledged that both India and uh, both uh, New Delhi and Islamabad have been trying to resolve the dispute over the Dogra state of JNK. And by the Dogra state, I mean the state in its entirety on all sides of the line of control. Uh, you know, uh, they've been trying to resolve it without any success for almost 75 years now. Uh, it began after both these states colluded, and I use the word advisedly, to exclude the peoples of the, of the state from any substantive participation in their futures, in their own futures. This happened when they took the dispute, India and Pakistan, to the United Nations, where only India and Pakistan were and continue to remain the parties named in the dispute. Since then, they have tried to solve the problem with talks unending at tables, but which were never followed up with any credible action of any kind. Uh, nor has there been any pretense, and this is my third point, on the part of either New Delhi or Islamabad, that the peoples of the Dogra state of JNK will be included in the negotiations. That said, it must be acknowledged that the capitals of the two status quo states did engage in dialogues with citizens on their sides of the line of control. But there was a difference. They, that is either Delhi or Islamabad, sought to mitigate, which has the sense of appease or mollify the aspirations of the people rather than solve, which means finding an answer to the problem. In the pursuit of this tactic, Delhi crafted something called Article 370 and other laws into its constitution to appease the state citizens. Islamabad similarly crafted a fresh name, Azad Jammu and Kashmir, to make its portion of the spoils of the 18 month Indo-Pakistan War of 1947 and 48 sound free. The existence of mammoth gaps between the rhetoric of these appeasements and their erosion, which almost occurred uh, at the same time, are a moot topic for discussion, albeit not necessarily today at any length. The dates and contents of more than 70 such attempts are a matter of record now. All of the above is, to, is not to say or to pretend that the BJP's abdication of a policy of 70 years of talks, they were never negotiations, but talks with the citizens of LOC East or this side of the line of control has been a picnic for us in Ladakh, Kashmir and Jammu. And I name these regions separately. Why I name them separately will become uh, soon, uh, you know, clear very soon. Uh, and particularly why I named them separately since after 2019. Depending on which part of the state you belong to or which time period you are referring to, the politics of the G G uh, BJP over the last two years has been misleading, devious, and in many instances, brutal. But these same adjectives could be used to describe the actions of previous governments, that is non previous non BJP governments also in New Delhi. What makes the B BJP different, it bears some repeating, 
is that it is doing so unilaterally without apologies to India's constitutional commitment to a secular republic or its special promises to the peoples of the JNK state, at least on this side of the line of control. And apparently, and transparently, they're doing this transparently before both domestic and international audiences. So I term this, in a sense, the cost of electoral politics. Um, and here I want to just briefly remember the ground situation as we veered into two, 2019. It was a year with momentous implications for India, regardless of events in Kashmir. To understand it better, we need to reach into the immediate past just before August 5th, 2019. So what were the circumstances then? One, the BJP had lost three state elections in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Chhattisgarh, sort of almost uh, in, in a row, just before 2019. This was more than a usual setback for the BJP because, if anything, that party's skills in winning elections is the centerpiece of its tactics, tactics that the Congress and most other parties have miserably failed to counter for almost eight years now. Number two, it was not a good sign for the BJP for another reason. General elections were scheduled to take place around the corner in April and May of 2019. Then on February 14, 2019, there was a devastating attack on a convoy of Central Reserve Police Force, uh, which is the CRPF in Kashmir, killing 40 Jawans or basically foot soldiers. The anger, understandably, was palpable throughout the country as people mourned at this sudden escalation, defying the downward trend in such attacks over the last, uh, the, the few years previous. The needle of blame quickly, almost immediately, was pointed at Pakistan. Less than two weeks later, the Indian Air Force struck at Balako, just across the LOC, and the next day, Pakistan struck back. And I cannot sort of describe for you how scary it was to be in Kashmir and sort of, you know, be completely uh, uh, not in a position of any kind of control over this and the, having the events unravel. Eventually, international in, uh, intervention, arguably, resulted in the secession of this dangerous escalation of hostilities. Meanwhile, the 2019 general elections were held less than two months after the blast at Pulwama in April and May, and the BJP returned to power with an 8% increase in the popular vote. And when you have 8% of a billion point three um, uh, population, that's a significant rise and an overwhelming majority in parliament all at the same time. So let me conclude uh, my narrative of this sequence of facts over just before 2019 with two important observations. One, the Pulwama attack was given as the reason for this near war between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, but no evidence has been preferred since. And number two, one of India's leading weeklies the front line in its uh, 12th March 2000, uh, 2021 edition, that is two years after the attack, published an eminently credible report that there were at least 11 documented pieces of actionable intelligence that an attack was imminent. There has been no officially announced investigation and indeed follow-up coverage in the media of this, I think, very important and critical report. So I put these facts before you to tell you that, in a sense, in retrospect, um, August 5, 5, 2019, was not all that much of a surprise, you know. So what was it like on the 5th of August, 2019? Let me plunge into a brief review of the two-year history 
of the former state of JNK um, with this. August 5 had been preceded for at least a month and a half by rumors of the BJP's intention to abrogate Article 370 of imminent terrorist attacks in Srinagar and of war with Pakistan. All these rumors were floating around simultaneously in different directions. And there was, I mean, and, and there were conflicting sort of reactions to it, official reactions. For example, the then governor said, oh, this is all bunkum, you know, and others would say, no, it's not. One of these things is going to happen and so forth. Then on around August 1st, there was an official announcement that all residents of Kashmir and implication being non-Muslim residents of Kashmir should leave or evacuate Kashmir. And some, such as non-resident Kashmiri students from the National Institute of Technology, were told that they would be provided transport out of Kashmir, which they were. Meanwhile, daily wage laborers from Bihar to Punjab, tourists and even some government workers were scrambling to buy tickets uh, for buses, cars, airplanes, crowding around airports to bus stands, bus stands uh, setting off a mood of panic all over Kashmir. As if to corroborate the veracity of these rumors, plane loads of army and paramilitary forces were being flown in for all to see and, and know into, and uh, sort of now into an already militarized, I mean, we have, we had 500 thousand, I mean, half a million uh, uh, army personnel over here already in Kashmir. So this was all in addition to that. So it is an unnerving feel. When we woke up early on the morning of the 5th of August, it was a, to a cold hush, one that wasn't just silent, but full of fear, to cite a recent book. The mobile telephones went dead, the landlines did not even have any static effect, and there was no movement whatsoever for seven hours almost outside our houses, be it of vehicles, humans, or on their uh, uh, humans out on their usual morning walks. The rumors that we had been living with for the past few weeks and months prior to added a sense of fear. I've taken some time to talk about uh, this morning for two practical reasons and not to suggest an argument of, you know, from victimhood of some kind or the other. Rather, I rehash the events to understand them better in retrospect. The two reasons are, one, as the, war, uh, as the days wore on, it became clear that this was a very carefully planned and meticulously executed operation. And number two, a large swath of the population uh, has, still, uh, uh, has still not, two years on, emerged from the trauma of the experience of the helplessness felt after August 5th. And speaking for myself, I've not, you know, sort of uh, been, been uh, I have not been able to shed the trauma as myself as yet. And this is important to know to understand the present day affairs in Kashmir. To say planned in advance is an understatement. It was an operation that included meticulous political, military, psychological, and legal preparations. And let me just give you a few examples of them because otherwise, you know, it's a eat away at the time. Politically, that Delhi would not allow dialogue with, uh, or would not have, or dialogue with dissenters and anti-India, uh, Indian resistance, uh, was an already well-established rule of thumb. The anti-Indian resistance, I mean, obviously the Hurriyat and, and others. What it means came to light as mass arrests and detention of Kashmiri political leaders and cadres, including pro-India politicians themselves were made and summarily jailed in Kashmir or taken elsewhere to other parts of India. Militarily, as Robert Fisk, the veteran and deeply insightful expert on the Middle East, uh, on Middle East politics, wrote three weeks later, I think it was around uh, August 28th or so, the operations had all the makings of mil Israeli military action. And I'll leave it at that. Psychologically, 
the groundswell of rumors was spun so meticulously that it had something of a Homeric ring to it. Let me hear a quote from his Odysseus. As Telemachus sets out to look for his father, lost for 10 years with an expectant hopelessness that is pointly, palp poignantly palpable. Some, and I quote, some may tell me something or I may catch a rumor straight from Zeus, rumor that carries news to men like nothing else. Legally too, the ru uh, ruling dispensation was careful technically to avoid illegal illegality while still achieving its objective of making Article 370 inoperable. The homework had been done well in advance. In a telling interview with Subhas Kashyap on July 1st, that is more than a month uh, before August 5th, a lead, uh, Subhas Kashyap, who is a leading authority on, on the Indian constitution, places on record that Article 370 could not be abrogated without the consent of the state, that is the provincial, that is the Kashmir uh, JNK National Assembly, or uh, uh, State Assembly. To be fair to the BJP, it has not abrogated Article 370. It remains on the book, but as a derogated shell. This was a month before uh, August 5th, all right? So where are we now? Let us try to understand what has happened in a transparent sense. When um, uh, the uh, Article 370 was read down, so to speak, or derogated, one, there were several actions that were happening, uh, you know, a few days the, uh, afterwards. One was the disassembly of the state into two union territories, the union territory of Ladakh, which included Kargil and Leh, and then the union territory of JNK, meaning Jammu and Kashmir. It is uh, today ruled by a lieutenant governor because it was downgraded, so to speak, and neither territory has had any elections. So it is being governed by unelected officials, uh, bureaucrats basically uh, in, in uh, large numbers. The result of this is that before, and I'll sort of uh, talk about it a little bit, is, a, is that before 2019, there was only one trouble spot and that was called Kashmir. Today, uh, and, and largely Ladakh and Jammu had very little argument with Delhi. Today, there are four, if not more, trouble spots. And let me say a little bit about each of them. Leh, uh, which is a district within the Union Territory of Ladakh, you know. And Leh, which had been agitating, actually, for a Union Territory status for 20 years, uh, if not more, uh, because the claim is that it had argued that even before. Um, when they have received union territory status, but are now hugely disenchanted. And they're disenchanted because union territory did not translate as um, greater autonomy. In fact, it became ruled directly by the center. So it was almost sort of like you know, having to question which part of union and territory did we not get, you know, in, in asking for union territory. So that was one. Kargil was always opposed, opposed to the union territory status, but then after sort of it was granted, they became, um, so shall we say, pragmatic about it. Uh, but at the same time, was in touch with lay to figure out what was going to go, uh, uh, what, were, what did it imply for them, you know, and they found out not very much and actually a loss of a great deal of autonomy. So almost in a historic uh, sort of uh, turning of the tables, in September, just a month ago, um, Kargil and Leh became united in their politics for the first time in over 40 years, 
which was an amazing feat accomplished by the BJP, which the two uh, sort of districts had not been able to accomplish on their own. You know, Jammu has found out that it has lost commercially and politically the BJP uh, and politically. The, B, the BJP cadre, from a political point of view, they have found out that um, they are to be ruled by a BJP representative, albeit from uh, Jammu itself, uh, from Delhi and not as a local cadre. You know, so there's unhappiness there. And commercially, they've realized that they've lost out because their contacts with Kashmir, commercial contacts with Kashmir are severed. Not only that, but um, sort of commercial houses from mainland India have also come in, you know, into, into uh, there uh, to sort of dilute their commercial strength. And Kashmir, I mean, has of course been a known travel spot, but there um, there have been incremental changes made day, uh, sort of almost on a daily basis. Um, and the large categories of these are first, uh, the land itself, the right of commons, um, you know, uh, which we call Gasterai, which belonged to the public at large, now belongs directly to the government. And so there's very little maneuvering uh, that can be done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Kashmiri possession of these. Two job opportunities for Kashmiris have hugely reduced uh, been reduced and government uh, employees almost regularly go through loyalty checks um, you know as we go and this includes in the colleges and universities on such days as Independence Day and so forth where um, it, it is monitored that they do what they're supposed to do which is um, you know sort of uh, and, 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 and openly and transparently so um, which is recognized uh, allegiance, you know, to to uh, India, India's constitution, and so forth, you know. Um, and just recently, uh, I think uh, several uh, employees of the government were dismissed outright um, for engaging in anti-national activities uh, with no uh, recourse to uh, any investigation, or at least uh, no uh, mention of you know, uh, further investigations uh, to prove their guilt or uh, innocence um, to be contemplated. I mean, so that's the kind of changes. Um, what was it that the government hoped to achieve, you know, in all this? Um, the government itself was not very forthcoming on it. So we have to speculate a little bit on this. Um, one, it appears that it was an attempt to have Kashmir politically dominated by Jammu, where the BJP does have a strong base. You know. Uh, secondly, the aim seems to have been to have Kargil dominated by Leh, where there is a Buddhist majority. Although in Ladakh as a whole, Muslims are in a slight majority overall by 2% or so. You know. And three, the, I think the aim was to have within Kashmir, where it is very difficult, even under the current circumstances for the BJ to have any kind of a majority, to have a sort of Trojan horse type BJP machinery that could and would be influential. So overall, it seems that it was an attempt to, and I've been toying with this idea, you know, to, to, to do or to mimic Assam's dismantling in the 1960s, you know. And if that is to be a judge in history, uh, then, you know, Delhi has just bought itself a lot of problems because suddenly you have many uh, sort of uh, trouble spots, you know, all over, which has proven true in certainly in the Northeast. What has been the result of this? You know, and I think that it can, it can be fairly said that the BJP has failed to achieve any of the above objectives that I set out right at the beginning. You know. So where are we? 
I mean, and in Kashmir. And um, I just, here I want to switch slightly and talk about South Asia as a whole, um, and, and then sort of open it up to questions uh, if need be. On trips to Delhi of late, um, friends keep asking me, okay, what's going on in Kashmir? What's happening in Kashmir and so forth? And that they're troubled by it and, and things. And I'm obviously talking about, you know, sort of liberal Indians who, who are concerned about Kashmir. Um, and my answer and answer of a lot of us uh, has been that, well, you know, let's forget about Kashmir for a while. What's happening in India? You know, and, and actually to point that out, because the changes in India have been so massive over the last seven years that it really is a scary proposition to know what the future is going to look like. Um, and my question to my friends uh, is not done in a facetious manner. Indian politics has become dysfunction dysfunctional. And I think that that is something uh, that we have to look for in the future as to what it is going to mean. Um, you know, and I think that the whole thing is that the shift of the importance of purely electoral politics rather than any other kind of politics um, is something that I think um, is proving to be extremely dangerous for us uh, in, in South Asia as a whole you know, is that which party wins. And the party that has the best machinery for that uh, is going to stay in power as long as possible. And as I uh, observed a little while ago, you know, there doesn't seem to be any party um, that is national at any rate, you know, I, I mean, in, in any real sense of that word, uh, which has a response, you know, to, I think, an extremely efficient machinery that the BJP has, you know. So I just want to insert another thought in this. And that is that from a Kashmir point of view, you know, it's becoming sort of starting to become obvious that really, you know, is it uh, uh, of any uh, benefit to us either to look to Delhi or to Islamabad for any kind of a solution? You know, and because both do not sort of seem to want our participation in it, but on a you know at a at a broader level, what seems to be the case is that we have uh, now a situation where it is Washington and Beijing that are determining you know what is happening in South Asia, particularly after the American withdrawal. Uh, sudden and, and chaotic uh, from Afghanistan. You know, and I say this because I think the danger of that is us slipping into uh, a sort of another Cold War mode with the actors being slightly different in the sense that the US continues there, but China, you know, is, is a new player in this whole setup. Um, and as a result, not just, I mean, Kashmir sort of really big, fades into the background. And we are potentially looking at all of South Asia, which is 2 billion strong, over 2 billion strong, when you add all the countries together, you know, uh, suddenly not having a voice, you know, in world affairs, not having an independent uh, you know, autonomous voice of their own uh, in it. And this is where I, I would fault uh, the BJP regime in, you know, sort of because of the whole thing, are we making the whole uh, sort of, of South Asia dysfunctional and not ha having a voice? And given the diversity, the rich diversity um, and the founts of knowledge or knowledges that we have here in South Asia as a whole. I mean, this is like a massively uh, sort of uh, exploded um, uh, Europe, you know, uh, thing. Um, what does it spell for the future? You know, and, and that is the thing that um, 
uh, is worrisome, I think. And that is the thing that we need to address in all of South Asia. Um, and, and I think, I mean, w- one of my uh, sort of uh, hypotheses, you know, is that now the theater for the new Cold War has become South Asia, you know, and, and with that, Kashmir has uh, sort of taken front and center spot. Um, and it could arguably, and I have argued it in writing and, and um, you know, in, in various forums, um, is that I think it was triggered by August 5th, 2019. So with that, I'll stop and would welcome any questions uh, that there might be, and I'll try to answer as best as I can. Thank you. Well, thank you for a very informative uh, talk, uh, Professor Vahid. Um, I mean, in in some ways, I mean, I'm asking the same question uh, that you have been addressing, but maybe I'll try and draw you out a bit more. I mean, it's clear that India's handling or New Delhi's handling of um, the Kashmir uh, uh, issue in recent recent years, uh, I mean, you know, we were all talking about what this means for the future of Indian federalism. I mean, if you can unilaterally, without consulting the people, abolish a state, what does this mean really? And I think you you, 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 you've suggested that this is the new uh, sort of situation in, 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 in South Asia uh, as a whole, uh, which potentially, as you suggest, is very destabilizing. So that's really one issue which I, where I'm in agreement with you. But my question to you specifically relates to uh, the abolition of Article 35A and what that means um, now. Uh, and I mean, you, you very sort of eloquently talked about uh, the unintended consequences of New Delhi's decision in Leh, uh, Kargil, Jammu, particularly Jammu. Uh, but this particular sort of issue is one that clearly affects a lot of people in Kashmir, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the right of property ownership. And I really, on that question, my question really is, is whether the one place you haven't mentioned uh, is Palestine. And my question relates to, 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 to the extent to, to which India and its designs on uh, uh, Kashmir can, can, can lead to a situation um, uh, like Palestine with Israeli settlements in the midst of uh, the Arab population. And I wonder whether any thought or concern is being given to this possibility in the future. Mm. Uh, could you just sort of educate us on this? Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, well, I, um, as far as Article 370 goes, even prior to um, uh, August 5th, uh, 2019, it had been to a large extent hollowed out, you know, and as you know, um, it, it, it started to be hollowed out almost immediately after 1952, when the basic frame of it was, was established in 1953 with the arrest of Sheikh Abdullah. And then after that, you know, all the sort of change, uh, all the implications of uh, Article 370 and the, uh, the constitution of, of Kashmir, the separate constitution of uh, JNK and so forth, was started uh, started to be uh, changed, you know, by by a uh, party, uh, the National Conference that was led by one of Sheikh Abdullah's rivals, uh, Ghulam Ahmad Bakshi, etc. You know, so I think that really the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, Article 370 became a, an issue which was neutralized quite early on and has been neutralized quite early on. Um, and I think that that in many ways was what uh, sort of triggered uh, 1989, uh, even 1987, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, where people were actually fighting elections you know, within the Indian constitution. So I think that that's what triggered the whole thing and which for which, you know, the last 30 years have been such so brutal for us uh, in uh, Kashmir and in, in other ways in JNK state as a whole. Um, as far as land rights go, you know, Article 370 actually did not address it. You know, it was addressed uh, later on by something called Article 35A. Uh, which was promulgated by uh, a presidential ordinance uh, in India, which said that the land rights would be reserved for citizens of the state of JNK. 
or JNK state subjects, as, as we were called then. You know. So that it was Article 35A. And today, that is under threat as well, as you know. You know. So I think that um, we tend, I think now in Kashmir, to talk less about 370 and more about the 35A because of its uh, uh, sort of uh, the importance of it in terms of the land uh, uh, rights uh, and and what it implies for land rights for Kashmiris um, or JNK citizens. I mean, not just Kashmiris, but obviously Ladakhis in Kargil and Leh and Jammuites, etc. Um, and things. Um, as far as Palestine goes, uh, I think uh, that we are there you know, in, in being very comparable to Palestine. And I say this because uh, not very long before his passing, um, I had a brief conversation with Edward Said, you know, uh, and I uh, sort of, you know, uh, asked him, I said, what did he think about Kashmir? Um, and he said to me very, very gently, you know, he said, listen, I, I don't really know that much. Can you just give me a you know, sort of brief on it. And I gave him a brief, uh, sort of the elevator brief, you know, um, on it. And, and he thought for a while after it, and he said, well, we're similar, but we're not the same because you have the land, you know. Um, and now it's questionable as to whether we have the land, you know. And so in a sense, we've arrived at that spot, you know, that, that you were uh, wondering if there were any, comparables, you know, but I think, I think we are there now. But what are the potential forces of resistance uh, to that in India? I think that's, I mean, or in Kashmir, that, that was my question, really. I mean, can India, mm. I mean, can, can Kashmir really become the many yeah. different other factors? It's not just the land. There are mm. many other issues here. Uh, yeah. The security issues as well. Uh, yes. and, and I mean, I wonder, so, I mean, maybe it's too early to raise this question, but it's one that really is for, for, you know, in, 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 in my mind, one of the most crucial ones uh, yes. to yes. determine how South Asia yes. as a whole is impacted, because Correct. it's really what happens in Kashmir on this issue and yes. the reactions uh, it, it sort of, but let me not sort of hold you uh, any longer. Uh, and I think there are lots of questions. No, I'd like, to, I'd like to answer that question though. Sure. Because, okay, please do, please do. It, it please. Uses, I mean, it seizes us quite uh, repeatedly. Yes. Um, and, you know, we ourselves over here sometimes get depressed. I mean, because we say, hey, there's no protest. I mean, there's nothing happening um, and so forth. And one thing that I have uh, sort of realized from that is that the protest doesn't have to be on the streets. It doesn't have to be loud. Uh, and it happens. I mean, it's there. It's there day in and day out. And it happens in very innocuous ways um, and things. That doesn't mean to undermine somebody or to, you know, throw, throw stones at people, etc. It just happens because it's there. You know, the hearts and minds have not been won. I mean, it's as simple as that. And that doesn't have to be. The other thing to remember also, and this was in the aftermath of um, um, uh, August 5th, uh, was that there was from Delhi, there was a reaction. Uh, and the reaction was, hey, you know, there are no protests. And so it was a great success. There were no killings, um, and, and which is debatable, but, you know, sort of uh, that this didn't happen. There was no stone throwing, etc. And so we were right and all is well, you know. Uh, and uh, there were others, um, and, and there were voices, I think, from Pakistan publicly saying that, hey, why aren't Kashmiris protesting? you know, and things, which was why I talked about the psychological feelings just after August 5th, is that it was a state of, I wouldn't even say shock, you know, it was sort of a di complete disbelief, you know, and, and it was also a very, very heavy uh, sort of load, you know, on us suddenly, you know, and here I sort of recall ages ago, I mean, I think it was in the 60s, a paper that was written in the 60s, which referred to something called learned helplessness, you know, is that, you know, you, you just take a deep breath and you figure out what it is that's going to happen and so forth. So there's no doubt in my mind that we will continue to resist, you know, but what form it's going to take is very difficult. At the moment, I mean, my counsel to myself and to a lot of my uh, sort of 
uh, compatriots and, and friends and others, you know, is that, hey guys, I mean, when there's an avalanche coming down on us, don't try to be a hero, just get out of the way, you know, because you need to live to fight another day, you know? And I think that, I think that that's the attitude to adopt uh, rather than be dismayed by the fact that, oh, you know, there is no resistance or that there are no protests and things. I think that happens. Um, you know, it's, it's a, the, the vacuum has to be filled somehow when people don't have the power uh, that they're supposed to have, uh, you know, and particularly in a supposed democracy, you know, th those things. So, so there isn't going to be a vacuum, you know, uh, and, and it will happen. I, I hope to God it's peaceful. Uh, and I hope that it is civilized, in other words, negotiated, discussed, uh, rather than, you know, sort of agitated from both sides, you know, and things. Uh, but that's my hope. You know, that's that's the wish one has. But in a sense, what you're saying, there is no vacuum. The resistance continues even in Correct. silence. Uh, and yes. I mean, you know, with, with overwhelming power deployed against Kashmiris. Uh, I mean, it's in fact, I mean, contrary to what certain voices might have said in Pakistan about yes. actual protests, I think uh, as far as I'm aware, people have been... Um, uh, uh, I mean, remarkably sort of, you know, surprised to see the resilience of Kashmiris and continuing to protest. I think that, I mean, you know, I, I think I completely agree with you that forms of protest can take many, um, uh, have different manifestations. But without further ado, I mean, there are questions. Fiza, would you uh, uh, help uh, Professor Vahid uh, uh, navigate these questions? So I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Of course. So we have a couple. We'll start with... Um, we have one from Siddharth Sridhar who's talking about how have the forms of civil resistance in Kashmir changed after August 5th, 2019? Ah, I think that was the, uh, that was the uh, question sort of, sort of uh, you know, halfway answered right now. I think that it's changed. Um, it, it's changed in the sense that there's no visible uh, sort of uh, civil protest all the time. I mean, there, there still are pockets of armed resistance that take place. I think that that is, um, you know, not, not very uh, sort of, uh, uh, it's not voluminous. I mean, by any stretch, you know, it's happening. But um, I think that largely uh, we, we, are, uh, we don't uh, go out there, you know, uh, and I think it has to do with fear. You know, just fear that uh, the laws and rules are such that at the very minimum, you can be, you know, sort of incarcerated uh, for any length of time. And people have been uh, for several uh, lengths of time. Uh, I, I, or on the other hand, you can be shot, you know. And so, so I think, I mean, you know, people don't uh, strive to be martyrs, you know. I mean, they, they, it's, just, it's just human nature. I think that you do want to survive, you know. And and want to want your whatever you know form of protest to to matter to make a difference, uh, and if you see that it's not going to make a difference, then you calm down, you know. So, thank you. The From effectiveness Sanjay. of resistance is, I think, the 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 the, 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 the really what is underlining that. I think it's a yes. question of timing as well, and I think that's yes. a very interesting. Uh, so I mean, I mean, I think people are watching Kashmiris with great interest. Um, yes. And not losing hope at all. Uh, I, I think yeah. that's my uh, reading of it. Go ahead. Well, I think that's, I, yes, you touched on that. And, and it's something that has been occupying me for a long time now. And that is that in many ways, many of the things that happen day in and day out, you know, are not, is, is not to, you know, necessarily uh, sort of harm an individual or a group or anything like that. It is, even more sinister than that, and that is to kill hope itself, you know, and I think the challenge for us is to keep that hope alive, you know, within us individually, day in and day out. Thank you. From Saima Khwaja, we have a couple of comparative questions that are coming up. I'm hoping to hear what you think is the future of Kashmir in relation with current, the current situation in Afghanistan. Do you think the situation might get better with another party in power in Delhi? Mm. Um, well, in relation to Afghanistan, 
a bit early right now, I think, because uh, I think the situation in Afghanistan is fluid. Uh, uh, I think that it would be fair to say that Afghanistan is not the same Afghanistan that was 20 years ago under the Taliban. I think it would be safe to say that Pakistan was not the same country that it was 20 years ago. I think it's eminently safe to say that India is not the same country it was 20 years ago, as well as China not being the same country. Remember, I mean, that was not too far from Tiananmen Square and, and so forth, is not the same country as it was before. They're not necessarily uh, polar opposites of what they were, but nor are they uh, the same, you know? So I think that this entire thing of uh, the uh, American chaotic uh, withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan has thrown up uh, uh, a situation in South Asia, which if you look at silver linings can say that, hey, there may be opportunities, you know, a, in South Asia, a confederation, you know, of nation. I don't know. I mean, uh, so that's, that's how one keeps uh, one's hopes alive, you know, is that, uh, is that there are opportunities and adversity and so forth. And that's uh, what, uh, what I think we should look forward to. Um, as I, I, there was a second part to that question by Saima, I think. Uh, was there? Or have I yes. answered? Do you the think second that... part is a, a whether a party, a change of, of parties in party. Yes. Power. Well, uh, uh, that is, yeah, well, that's an interesting question, you know, because we here uh, in Kashmir may think, oh, a change of party will resolve the problem. I think the problem is much deeper than that. You know, I think I think that is that is that uh, Delhi, Delhi, I don't mean a political party in Delhi. I think a Delhi will have to reinvent itself. I think we in Kashmir or JNK state as a whole have to reinvent ourselves, you know, just like we have to reinvent ourselves vis-a-vis -vis even the resistance, you know, as to what it's going to look like. I mean, we haven't spoken about the Hurriyat, for example, I mean, but the Hurriyat is a bastion of uh, resistance, you know, and, and a symbol of resistance uh, in it. It will have to reinvent itself. And I think that those are some of the things to look for. Two years, I mean, in historical terms is not uh, not, not a very long time, you know. So I think that we're still evolving, I think, uh, and, and trying to gauge the situation. I think uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and so the short answer to that question is that a change of government in Delhi uh, may ease uh, the, the uh, sort of, you know, immediate pains that Kashmir has or pangs of uh, pain that, that Kashmir on, uh, has, you know. But I don't know that it will you know, sort of necessarily change the overall policy on Kashmir. I mean, bear in mind that when Article, uh, 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 sorry, when uh, uh, Article 370 was read down, derogated, whatever, you know, or basically made ineffective, uh, there were not many uh, uh, central parties uh, or federal parties uh, in India that spoke up, you know, and there was not. I mean, I think the Communist Party of India, Marxist, is one party that even published, uh, you know, its opposition to that, uh, but, you know, uh, sort of in a limited way. But I think that, so I think that you have to bear that in mind. And one of the things that I've said is that in 2014, it was not just a change of political guard, you know, or political parties. I think that India changed, you know, for, 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 I mean, in fact, I think I wrote it, you know, soon after that, that it's a sign that India is changing. And certainly 2019 demonstrated it with both, you know, uh, with an 8% increase in the popular vote for the BJP, uh, plus, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a ma uh, overwhelming majority in parliament. I mean, these are realities, you know, of the kind of democracy um, that uh, parliamentary democracy, I mean, uh, that India has. I mean, you know, we have to accept it uh, at, at face value and see what does it mean for us uh, and, and how do we adjust accordingly, you know. Thank you. We have a question that's quite similar, um, again, which is asking, with Kashmir becoming the centerpiece of India's domestic politics and this finding an animated audience in India, 
Do you believe that the opposition, rather the Congress, would show the nerve to undo the actions of August 5th, 2019, if it were to return to power? If not, what options remain for the constituency in Kashmir that believes in peaceful pursuit in the form of dialogue and negotiation of their political aspirations? Well, I mean, you know, I really don't know um, uh, which way the Congress is going to go. I think that 2024, which is going to be the next election, uh, general elections, uh, is going to be a huge watershed uh, for India as a whole, and uh, obviously for the Congress uh, to prove itself. At the moment, I don't see any, uh, you know, any uh, sort of bright light uh, from emerging from the Congress in order to set it, maybe there'll be a coalition or whatever, you know. But um, so, so, I, what was the main question? <laughs> Sorry, I I lost it. Uh, I've forgotten the the key. The main question, as I see it, is I mean, but in the absence of any change in New Delhi, which I think you adequately. Yes. said that it's not going to really yeah. make that much of a difference. What options are there for Kashmiris who don't oh, want Kashmir. to take, pick up the gun and want a peaceful I think, yeah. negotiations? I, think, I mean, there are no options, it seems. Yeah, uh, really. there, I, there are not many options for us. I mean, I, you know, I think that, I think, uh, that the guns, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily an answer because, you know, there are much bigger ones on the other side. And, and, and you know, and even that, I mean, I, in principle, I don't think violence, um, you know, sort of um, will will do the job, so to speak. I think that um, uh, our sort of position needs to be from the point of view of talking this out, number one, but insisting, and here I must underline, insisting to both um, India as well as Pakistan that when and if they sit down to talk about it, I think it is critical to have us at the high table in whatever form um, from the get-go, you know. And the very simple reason for that is that they haven't succeeded in solving the problem as opposed to mitigating it, you know, in the last 75 years. And I think that whenever they, the two of them, set out to do it, there were no, there was no representation from our side, you know, from the Kashmir side. So I think that 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 is uh, sort of the kind of argument we have to make uh, in in the realm of you know negotiations, talks, uh, and uh, conversations, uh, dialogue uh, regarding Kashmir is that we be there because, quite frankly, I mean. You know, sometimes I'm very puzzled is that what is it, you know, what is the kind of harm that Kashmir can do to India or to Pakistan? You know, and, and I, during the main part of my talk, I said that there was, at, at some level, there was some sort of a tacit collusion, you know, between Delhi and Islamabad, vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir, uh, in, in um, sort of, you know, absenting it from the discussions in any substantive way, you know, and I think that time has come for us to now talk about, you know, having that take place. Thank you. Another question. Firstly, while you have pointed to the role of the BJP, but I've also pointed out that the problem in Kashmir goes much before. Do you believe that irrespective of whichever party is in power, is there a deep state of India by this? I mean, the military, India's industrial industrial military complex, which benefits from keeping the issue burning. Uh, Fisa, in the future, can you just sort of say whose question you are asking? Sure. This is I mean... Tadagat Datta. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I deep state, I'm not quite sure what, I mean, I, I sort of know, but I don't really know what deep state means. Um, I think, I think, I mean, that's my ignorance. It's not, not anything else. Uh, but uh, you, you know, it, it's I. One thing that I think I, I am uh, sort of I, I should make clear, you know, is that you know the the role of the army um, in India has been. Uh, over, I mean, Indian politics overall has been benign, 
you know, in, in terms of the direction of the country and so forth. Uh, it's not been completely benign when it comes to Kashmir. I mean, that, that has to be uh, put up front because it really is, um, you know, the, the something that we call the Armed Forces Special Powers Act uh, is actually a, an act that is, uh, that uh, uh, sort of condones military rule you know, in, in the state of JNK. So, so therefore, I mean, or, or did in the state of JNK, in the former state of JNK, and now perhaps, you know, attenuates itself to only to Kashmir, you know, because it really doesn't see the need in, in uh, Ladakh, uh, whether it be Kargil or Leh, uh, or in Jammu. So I think that that, that is, is problematic, uh, you know, when it comes to Kashmir, but when it comes to overall, India, I think, uh, you know, objectively speaking, the army is not, you know, really uh, deployed all that much. I mean, maybe perhaps, I mean, perhaps I uh, err there in saying that in all uh, conflict zones in India, and there's more than Kashmir, obviously, you know, uh, within Kashmir, the army has been deployed. And I'm, you know, I'm not that certain. I think that it has been uh, brutal where it concerns the Northeast uh, or was. Um, at, at the moment, I don't know what, what it's like, but um, so I mean, I you know, I don't think I mean, I, uh, the implication of the question that somehow there's some sort of a convergence. Uh, I I don't I don't see it as having happened very effectively in the past between civil and military rule. Um, of late, there's been a more of a convergence. Um, but not, you know, uniformly in the army, so to speak. I mean, you know, even in the army, there are, I think, dissenters who say, you know, we shouldn't get involved and so forth. So, Thank you. He actually has a second question, which is asking if a third front, uh, which is a more federal front, gains power in the center, is there more hope? Is a more federal solution needed at an all India basis to really come out to a sensible position on Kashmir? Mm. Well, it's hard to say, you know, I think, I think that, um, I think to resolve Kashmir, uh, you need uh, an out of box kind of thinking um, that I really don't see on the horizon. You know, I think that it will have to play itself out and things. Uh, what a third, uh, uh, fr uh, the third front, I mean, you know, apart from the Congress and the thing, if, if a third part comes, uh, then it'll be interesting. I mean, I've heard voices uh, in the Indian polity, uh, amongst Indian politicians, um, who, who say that, you know, we should federalize a lot more. Uh, because ever since independence, of course, uh, India has done the opposite of federalized. It has centralized. Uh, you know, again and again and again, um, as the trajectory. And I think that uh, a study is due as to why that has been happening. Uh, one has a lot of, you know, theories uh, or hypotheses on that, but one doesn't know, you know, uh, for sure. But I think that that is something um, that, um, you know, to, to change uh, views on Kashmir, um, I really couldn't say, I mean, uh, that, that there will be any great thing, even if there is a third front. Uh, it just depends on what the mandate looks like, whether they act on the mandate. Um, and if they act on the mandate, what will the opposition uh, parties look like? I mean, you know, so I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Chandra Malampali, who's talking about how events in Kashmir occurred while the plight of Rohingya in Myanmar and Uyghurs in Xinjiang were drawing international attention, uh, particularly from the media. What connections, if any, do you see between these crises? Uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't, other than the obvious, and that is, it is peoples versus state. You know, uh, I think that that's, that's what it is, and and uh, pockets of people unfulfilled. I mean, I think every country in the world, uh, you know, has that thing. I think it's just the intensity uh, of it. I mean, in that same bracket falls the Uyghur, uh, Uyghur situation in Xinjiang, 
you know, in, in China. I think that these are, uh, th these are a symptom uh, of, uh, you know, people's aspirations for their, you know, identities, their, their um, you know, material needs, et cetera. I mean, all of them. And so, uh, you know, I think that that's the connection. I don't see, uh, but, you know, the connection is also timing. Right. I mean, 80, uh, you know, with the collapse of the old Cold War regime, uh, you know, we saw a, a lot of ferment happening, you know, um, and it did play itself out uh, across the globe, Europe, uh, here, of course, in Asia uh, and in the Middle East, everywhere, you know, it played itself out um, and uh, only to be rolled back, you know, with events being very different uh, soon thereafter you know, uh, and, and positions being taken, which were different, um, and so forth. So I, you know, I think, I think that those are connections enough. I mean, the solidarity, of course, you know, uh, people will have across the board, you know, we just talked about, maybe, to us, you know, to some extent, uh, between even Palestine and, and Kashmir, the feeling of, you know, what's happening. So thank you. We have a question from Shakir ul Hassan, um, who's talking about how he works on Mughal Kashmir. And uh, he says that the way Article 370 was removed and replaced was no different from the Mughal conquest of Kashmir. My question is that in that conquest in the post 370 times, if at all, how did the Indian state, like the Mughals, use the patronage of certain Kashmir groups by overt or covert means to complete the deal and fulfill purpose? Fulfill what purpose? <laughs> I'm assuming he means um, sort of the um, sort of the lack of state situation that there exists right now with Article 370. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. But, you know, I, think because, the, I think the uh, question is a bit sort of, um, uh, I mean, he's asking you to do a bit of uh, imaginative history to try to understand how the Mughals, who he claims, um, ran Kashmir in a similar way, which I think is the confusion of, 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 of epics and God knows uh, uh, forms of government. I mean, the Mughals were yeah. a person <coughs> like government India claims oh, well, to yeah, be the largest different. democracy. Uh, so I do right. think that that, I mean, the question is how did they achieve, wasn't it similar to the Mughals? And how did they use intermediaries and collaborators? I think that's mm. the question. Uh, but I think that the, there's a problem here with, with with the form of governments we are talking about. Yeah. Well, I think a form of governments also, uh, and all, I mean, you know, just the changes, uh, you know, technology, uh, communications, everything changed. So it's, my, I mean, in, in those days, I think it would be fair to say uh, that there was a huge amount of autonomy exercised. Uh, and if you didn't rub your rulers the wrong way, uh, you more or less, you know, could do whatever you set out to do, I mean, and things. And I think uh, now it's a lot more difficult uh, to do that, you know. So, yeah, I, I don't know. So that's a tough question. It's interesting. But. Yes. We have a question from Charlie Kong, who's asking, what are the implications of the BJP's actions for other regions of India, such as the Punjab? Hmm. Well, I think that um, one of the principles, uh, you know, that, uh, that I've toyed with is that whenever centrifugal forces uh, start to assert themselves, centripetal forces, uh, you know, react, uh, call it resistance, call it whatever. And I think that uh, that is uh, being seen, you know, uh, here. Uh, and uh, one example that I can give is the recent elections in West Bengal, you know, uh, where uh, Mamta Banerjee won uh, against uh, odds, one might say, you know, and huge odds. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, sort of addressed it very uh, sort of effectively. In fact, at one point, uh, Mamta Banerjee said, hey, listen, you know, all we want to the center to, to administer uh, in Bengal is uh, our foreign policy, our defense, and our communications, which sounded a lot like the uh, provisions of Article 370 to me, you know, and things, which means 
that uh, you know decentralize, federalize uh, you know uh, everyday lives of of the states. Uh, so um, I think that that is uh, will start to assert itself. It has already started to assert itself in a lot of ways. Um, you know, so we'll just see. I think I think that what is devastating about the BJP is that the efficiency with which they win elections. I mean, I just, you know, and, and, and the various uh, sort of permutations, combinations and power structure uh, that they affect so, so well, you know, over the, uh, over, over the sort of years. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Najpas Asakib, which says, what is your opinion on the Indian press with respect to Jammu and Kashmir? Given how the regime was largely able to keep the planning and coordination efforts under wraps prior to August 5th, is it fair to declare that the press at best failed at, in its job or at worst was complicit in ensuring that no meaningful leaks occurred that could have derailed this initiative? Uh, I, you know, the latter, definitely. You know, as is that uh, the huge sections of the media uh, in in India are complicit with the government. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, and the space actually over the years <coughs> has dwindled to being very narrow. You know. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Um, Anando Bhakto is asking, the Taliban's ascent to power in Kabul has been deciphered as a ramshackle force defeating the world's mightiest power. Will that spur the idea of armed rebellion across the world and in particular in Kashmir? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think, I think that uh, uh, situations are very different. The Taliban uh, is unapologetically uh, and unambiguously a pan-Islamist uh, thinking uh, government or, or a, a pan-Islamic thinking uh, uh, government, now government, and also uh, sort of power within uh, thing. Uh, I don't see that emerging in Kashmir. I mean, quite frankly, uh, is that that kind of thinking, so to speak, uh, emerging in Kashmir and other parts of the world. I mean, hard put to say. I mean, the question then becomes, you know, sort of will uh, will a pan-Islamist movement again uh, gain ground? You know, uh, thing. I, you know, I don't know, and I don't look at uh, pan-Islamism carefully enough to know whether, uh, you know, there is an uh, uh, a worldwide presence of it. You know. Um, except in terror organizations, which obviously exist, uh, but uh, pockets of them. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I would say. I think that in, Kash in the case of Kashmir, uh, my uh, response will be in the negative. I don't see that there will be a Talibanic inspiration in Kashmir of any magnitude. You know, um, be because I mean, you, you actually have to live in Kashmir to know uh, that uh, it would not subscribe to, to that kind of a view in the majority, I think. Um, and things and around the world, I really don't know. And that's a tough question. Yeah. Thank you. From Munish Verma, can anything be done in the world of talks or negotiations as people of the LOC East and West will be left on the sidelines every time? If hope is to be found anywhere, it may be in the option that the new Cold War creates for the peripheral peoples of South Asia. It seems hope is on thin ice. Yeah, well, I mean, thin ice is, is right. I, mean, I, I, I think, I mean, um, the new Cold War and, uh, you know, whether it will make more peripherals, what the new, uh, what the Cold War does do is sweep everything under the carpet. You know, and and this is what happened, I think, in the old uh, Cold War, um, and then it came out of the carpet, or you know, became a Pandora's box uh, when uh, 18, uh, 1991, 92 rolled around. You know, and and uh, I think that we are still sort of looking for this thing called the new world order. You know, and uh, it's striking. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a something viable on the table. 
uh, as of yet. I mean, I think I think that uh, both the United States, I mean, I don't know about the United States, but I think China is trying. Uh, uh, I think the United States is trying, uh, but not having reinvented itself in any way, at least with the last two administrations um, that that we've seen. So, so it's just, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 but I don't think, I mean, I don't think that um, the Cold War necessarily creates more peripherals. It's just that the peripherals disappear for a while because they're subject to, you know, whichever large state that they belong to, you know, and responses to it uh, will have to sort of be made in a uh, sort of upwardly cascading sense, you know, sort of up the pyramid, so to speak, uh, asking, you know, as to what should happen and so forth, because the determining factors are the two great powers, right? Um, in the moment, assuming that we do see the Cold War. I mean, I, I've been seeing this new Cold War literally for the last 10 years. I mean, um, uh, and I think I wrote about, not think, I know, I wrote about in 2011, you know, is that there seems to be this developing. So lately, I mean, it seems to be coming to fruition. I'm not so sure what shape it will take. Thank you. We have our last question from the audience, and I think it's a good one to end on. Um, if we could stand back and take stock, what would be your vision or, or a developing vision on the ground of what the state and the broader erstwhile state could look like after some of what the immediate dust has settled, or is it too soon yet to ask what comes next question? My concern is that given that these are long processes as you've described that are beyond the present political actors, what would be a more equitable resolution to the situation? I think, you know, I mean, I am often, I, I um, like I said, I mean, I think we're going to have to reinvent ourselves. I, I have a particular affinity to the JNK state and keep mentioning the Dogra state as a starting point because um, I feel that the seeds of the problem of JNK uh, was sown at its creation uh, in 1846, you know, which makes it, you know, 100. 50 plus years or oh, 180 almost years old, you know, is the, is in, it's in its creation. So I think that, uh, so the world is going to look very different, you know, and we have to live with it. You know, we have, we have to live and, and that different is looking like, you know, pulls towards fragmentation, you know, uh, and fragmentation is not always terrible. You know, it's like maybe, you can cater to the needs of the people if you're closer to the people. Uh, what militates against it, of course, uh, is the creation of great states, you know, uh, uh, or, or, you know, strong states and then strong empires, you know, and, and what that means, you know, for uh, local people, et cetera. Um, I think that that is, is uh, those are the two forces pulling. Um, and like I said, I mean, I'm not all that much a fan of, um, you know, sort of saying that it, it can be resolved somehow, uh, you know, by sort of power bargainings and stuff like that. I think that it, it, needs, uh, it needs some fundamental understanding of how power structures work and the fact that, you know, the closer it is to the ground uh, and, the, and the people who are most affected by it, the governance structures, you know, build from uh, the ground, uh, the better we have for the chances of survival and, and for uh, stability, you know, so. Okay, well, I mean, thank you so much uh, for an excellent uh, Q&A and your very uh, informative talk. I'm really grateful to you and wish you all the best. Thank Even you. though I do think that what you're saying towards the end is really something that we should take away is, is really structures of power and what they mean in this new uh, Cold War in South Asia that is on the horizons. It would seem to me, uh, listening to you, uh, Professor Rahid, uh, that uh, state structures in South Asia are being centralized 
as they lose real power. Real power comes with support of the people. And so the less support they have, the more the reliance on the centralization, which doesn't augur well. Uh, I mean, I wrote a book many years ago called Democracy and Authoritarianism in South Asia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I had suggested some of these trends, but now it seems um, that this is the trend uh, where India is going to as well. Pakistan, of course, has always been authoritarian, but the less New Delhi is able to exert itself, I mean, you've mentioned very eloquently the electoral aspect, what's happening to elections, but it would seem that these structures of power are actually more, uh, I mean, they've got feet of clay, it would seem, yeah. or very soon are going to have and, and but, but, but the power they have because of technology and the structure, uh, they will continue to ex exercise. So I think this may be a more interesting, I mean, in response to some of the questions about what power peripheral people may have, uh, I think their power is much greater than we realize. And this is a warning, I think, that's listening to you, even though you're very reluctant to commit yourself to what will happen in the future, which is very wise. Um, uh, but I still think that that's, The that I would take away from what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Fiza.